Um, before, I, before I go into the presentation, um, I just have a quick bit about myself. Uh, I'm a volunteer on the board, same as many volunteers up and down the, up and down the country, uh, helping the game and all its championships, competitions, running clubs. Uh, my day job, uh, I'm a CEO of a tech company. Um, we were listed on the, the stock exchange in London, and I still have to spend a lot of time with shareholders, uh, investors, pension funds, uh, you name it, all people who want to turn you upside down and empty your pockets. Um, part of that job uh, involves turning businesses around and trying to understand why businesses are no longer performing. And a lot of the time that comes down to a very simple thing, which is customers are falling out of love with the product. The products become far too expensive to make. Um, and essentially customers have found something better elsewhere, cheaper. And that, that kind of says a lot in terms of where we are with golf in Scotland. The second thing um, is that I've heard a great, deal about, or a great deal about grassroots golfer, and I'm not sure how you define a, a grassroots golfer, but if, um, if it means, you know, I was born and raised in a mining community. I, uh, you know, was brought up in a council house. I still live in that community. I still play at the local club. Um, I play as, as often as I can uh, with a group of friends. So I guess if that defines a grassroots golfer, I'm a grassroots golfer. And then I guess the third thing for me is I don't come at this with any baggage. Uh, I'm coming at it purely from a really kind of hard analytical business perspective. I've got no history in the game in terms of being on a, a club committee or council, areas, counties, anything like that. It's just a really, really hard look at where we are uh, and, and trying to convey that perspective for everybody in the room. Um, and, you know, in my, in my business life, uh, I, I read quite a lot because you have to keep up with the world nowadays. And one of the, the, the books that I like is by a guy called Jim Collins, and it's called Good to Great. And uh, he talks, and, and Good to Great is about understanding why businesses are successful and why some fail. So it's a study, it's not a theory. And one of the things he says is that you have to confront the brutal facts. If you want to change things and you want to improve your performance, you have to confront the brutal facts of where you are. And if you don't, if you try to pretend it's something else, ultimately you'll fail because you'll be tackling the wrong thing. So, without further ado, I don't need to tell any of you that the golf landscape is incredibly challenging. And why is it challenging? Well, if you look at membership decline, for the last 10 years, this game has been declining. You know, we've been losing roughly 5,000 members, club members, full members, every single year. And what I find really interesting about that is, you know, when I've, heard, I've listened to lots of people tell me about, you know, what happened with SGU and all the great committees we had and the great discussions, you know, I've heard a lot about the strategy we've had over the last 10 years and how it worked so well. But the question I keep coming back to is, well, if it all worked so well, how did we end up here? How did we end up with practically 50,000 members less in 10 years? 50,000 members less in 10 years. So if that's the front nine, what does the back nine look like? Well, you don't need a particularly expensive crystal ball to work out where the game's going. And there's some really good reasons for that. So you might say to me, listen, Stuart, that's not going to happen. You know, things will level out. I kid you not, they will not level out. And there's some very, very good reasons for that. So our back nine looks very much like our front nine, unless we choose to do things very, very differently. But what's the impact of that? So if we look five and 10 years out to the impact on the game, you know, if you assume, you don't have to assume, the average club member, or club member, number of club members is 302 across clubs in Scotland, and the average member fee is 478 pounds. In five years time, we'll have a 15% decline in membership, and that membership fee will have to go up, accounting for inflation at 2.5%, which the Office of National Statistics says will be the, roughly the number we'll get for the next five years. Right, fees will have to go up 34%. And the rock in the hard place is, that will be just to maintain the income line in clubs and cover cost. If clubs say, I tell you what, we're not going to put the fee up to cover the decline in members, right, then effectively your income is going to decline, and that's going to make it a real struggle for a lot of clubs. If you take that forward 10 years, membership fees will be about 84% higher. Now, that's going to vary slightly by club, but that is the impact to losing members. That is going to be a real struggle because you can see very quickly, you know, your 478 pounds in five years' time is 640. 
right, and by the time you get to 2027, 20, it's 880. So that's a fairly challenging prognosis in any walk of life. So what's behind that? What's driving the decline? Three things. First thing is an aging demographic, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But you have to combine it with an aging demographic and not recruiting and retaining younger members. The second thing is it's the emergence of a time-poor, squeezed middle uh, who are questioning the value of money for membership in their clubs, and I'll explain who they are for everyone to see. And the third thing is a market that's saturated with courses combined with greater course accessibility through online booking systems and the very low cost of a visit around that's made membership for a lot of people unnecessary. So, if you look at that demographic, right, this is why I said if you think that line's going to slow down any, it's not. And the reason for it is, is right in front of you. If you look at over 65s in clubs, who in five years' time will be 70, 10 years' time will be 75, 57,500. Now, you can practically add the first four categories of de the demographic there together, and you've not got that number of members. And then you look behind that, the second biggest category, 55 to 64, 44,500. So a substantial number of people playing the game are over 55. And I think the last time we looked, the average age of golfers in, in golf clubs was somewhere just uh, south of 60 for men and women. So this is a, a, a game with a very much aging demographic. You know, when Malcolm talks um, how, about how challenging the commercial world is, that makes it very difficult to get sponsors. Because, you know, whether it's from the digital world or anywhere else, sponsors want a return on their investment. They want something back in return for sponsoring our game. And when you look at the profile of golf, it's not the most attractive profile. If you then kind of break that down a bit, what you've got, and, and I'll talk a bit more about data later on, but what, what you've actually got is a situation where in a lot of clubs, and I, had to go, I must have gone through at least 100 websites uh, to do this, and not everyone's exactly the same, but what you've got is a situation in clubs where seniors, 65s and over, are getting a discount. Up to 25-year-old, 30-year-old in a lot of clubs are getting a discount, although you have to question when you see the, the demographic, whether taking the price of memberships down, uh, membership down is really getting more people into the game or more younger people into the game. And what you've got uh, is a whole of people in the middle there from about 30 to, to 65 who are paying the full, the full fee. And I've gone through loads of golf club websites to, to really understand and get my head around this. So what if in effect you have is a squeeze middle? Because that group in the middle there, they're the ones with families, they're, they're maybe working hard, you know, they're not able to play during the week, they've only got the weekend, and at the weekend, when you're saying you're going to go and play a five-hour a five round of golf or playing a medal, you know, it's a real challenge. And they're also the ones who are maybe only getting to pay, play 10 times a year, right? and maybe paying 700 pounds a year membership. Right? So it is a massive, massive challenge for them. Right? And that's where you start to get the question about value for money. You know, equally, um, if you look at the demographic split, men, men, women, women, women are less than 14% of the game. But if you look at the way work has evolved in Scotland, you know, it might have been the case in the 70s and 80s that you know, in terms of working split, it was 70% men, 30% women. It's now 50-50. And, and, and the reality is, I'm pretty sure the next set of statistics will show there's actually more women in work than men. And of course, here, here's, here's the thing. You know, what we have is, and, I, and I'm going to say this because it needs to be called out, we have golf clubs that predominantly are run by older white men, right, and we've got loads of interesting rules around access to the tee and everything at the weekend, but the harsh reality is, if you want to get more women into the game, and you can see from that demographic there is a massive opportunity to do it, there's going to have to be a really, really fundamental rethink right, about how we structure and how we run our clubs. Because if you're a working woman, uh, and you cannot play during the week, you want access to the course at the weekend, and if suddenly you find you can't get it for a whole other reasons or historical rules, uh, you're not going to join a golf club. So you know, I'm calling it out on, on behalf of the women. We need to really think very, very clearly about the future of this game and how we get more women in, because when you look at that graphic, it is a massive opportunity should we choose to accept it. 
So if you look at those, those groups, you know, what does that say? Um, what are the opportunities? Well, I think as Mel said in his presentation as well, working parents for young families. Family time is incredibly precious nowadays. You, as, as a parent myself, with a 13-year-old daughter, 19-year-old son, getting time with your kids is really important. Uh, and, and a fiver around the golf is at times just not compatible with that. Right, so time you can spend with your family is really precious. So what golf clubs do to address that is really important. Equally, I've just spoken about how we get more women into the game. But it's a game that's perceived by women in all the survey work, and I'll show you the survey work very, very shortly. It's a game that's perceived as being dominated by older males and not welcoming to women. Young people, you know, that, that's the future. We have to get more young people into the game as well. But again, I will talk about it later in the presentation how young people perceive golf clubs and what young people want. Uh, and, and equally for older people as well. This is not about saying older people are a problem. Absolutely not. You know, there are lots of things here in terms of health, companionship, social opportunity that make golf unique. It is a very, very unique game that we simply don't capitalize on. So, here's the next thing. And I've noticed in some of the questions coming out that this, this, this is a real theme. If you look at the game over the last 10 years, what, what we see uh, is club fees going up uh, by inflation or more every single year, but the price of playing as a visitor has actually gone down. And if I take a real life example, and this is, this is one club who can give us 10 years of history, 10 years ago this club's fee was £250 and the green fee was £38. If that had just tracked inflation, the sub, right, would have been 267 in 2017, 2016, and the green fee would have been 48 pounds. The reality is that the sub is actually 290 pounds, and the green fee is now 30. So the sub has actually massively outperformed inflation, and the green fee has actually gone massively under. So that leaves you with a situation where, if you look in 2007, Relative to the membership fee, you had to play around about, and the visitor round price, you had to play about 20 rounds of golf right, to justify your membership fee. That number for many, many clubs in this country is now north of 40. So you have to play 40 times a year minimum now to justify that fee. And equally, you no know, reasons for staying in club membership. When we analyze all the statistics from last year, only 53% of club members actually played in a formal golf competition. And only 47% of members, 47% submitted enough cards to either gain or, or retain a handicap. So 53% of people in, in a club uh, haven't even got a handicap. Therefore, they can't play in formal competitions. So when you combine all of these things together, so... Actually, if I only play 10 rounds a year and it only costs me 15 pounds, that's 150 pounds. Maybe I have to join as a social member for 50 pounds, that's 200, as opposed to paying 700 for membership. I don't need a handicap um, and I can still play all the golf I want. And in this day and age, when you're in that time squeeze middle, you know, who have just had mortgage increases, right, who, are, if rumor is to be believed, are just about to be hit with tax increases, you know, the, the golf sub, the golf membership, is way, way down the pecking order. You know, people will choose to have a roof over their heads, feed their kids and everything else long before they'll pay for the club membership. And if you can play your golf for £200 a year rather than a £700 a year membership, what choice would you make? So, some questions that come out of that, and, and, and we're going to talk about this. It's going to be a theme during the discussion over lunch. So how sustainable is visit around pricing relative to membership fee if it's driving people out of membership? How can we get a greater contribution from nomadic golfers? Is club membership or pay-as-you-go the best way forward, or is there a model that actually works for both? And have clubs got the competitive versus social golf balance right? Yep. And what do we mean by social golf? Because I, I know at the club I play at, uh, Broomy now, just in, in Bonnerig, you know, we can have the tea empty, not have a competition on a Saturday, but nobody's on the course. So what do we actually mean when we say social golf? You know, and with less, of, less than 50% of members having a handicap, what are the other 50% actually doing and how are they getting value for their membership? These are some really, really fundamental questions we need to ask. So what do members and non-members actually want from a golf club? 
well, top of every single survey is about having friends and family and fun. Right, that's what people want to have when they play golf. It's a leisure pursuit. It's a free time. You know, so people want to enjoy themselves. Uh, and they want to enjoy themselves with their family and friends. In terms of joining a golf club, so if you're a non-club member, the biggest barrier is cost. And that's understandable. Why would you want to pay for a membership? Uh, if actually it's much easier just to turn up and play when you want and pay a visitor fee. So cost is a big, a, a big issue. You know, equally, you know, buying equipment, we all know, is a big issue. But yet, how many clubs do we see having rental clubs that you can hire out fairly cheaply to go and play the game? You know, I, I, mean, I travel a lot in my job and I go to the States and practically every single club I've been to in the States, big or small, well-known, hardly known, has got rental clubs. And you can get a rental set for $10, $20. You know, but do we do that in this country? And for club members, the reasons that they joined the club is about convenience, right, about having a great course, um, and to have, tight, have fun time with family and friends. That's why we joined the club. So, and those, those are the real kind of key motivators. Those are the real reasons we want to join or why golfers tell us they want to join. And this survey that, that, that's been carried out, it's a number of different surveys, that is around about, it's between seven and 10,000 golfers that have been asked. So it's not a few hundred people this actually covers a, a, a huge spectrum in terms of golfers across, across Scotland and the rest of the UK. So it's really trying to understand the motivations behind club membership, joining the club and leaving the club. But again, if you look at this very closely, there's a lot here about fun, about fresh air and about friends. And there's actually a lot less about competitive golf. People don't generally join golf clubs to play comp competitive golf, or not everybody does. And then equally importantly, and this for me is a really, really key slide, if you, if you look at this in terms of association or word association, people find very, golf very sociable. But it's a social experience, but it is expensive. But if you look on here, and we've talked about how do you get more women into the game, and how do you get more children into the game, some are about halfway down. Are clubs welcome into women? Not really. And even worse, when you get second from the bottom there, are they welcome into children? Not really. In fact, not even at all in a lot of cases. You know, that's a fundamental issue that we have to tackle in the game because that's the future. If we don't get more children into the game, if they can't find enjoyment in being a member of a club and a golfer, we have got a problem because the one thing you cannot do with that demographic is it won't stop. We can't stop people getting older. So we have to really address some of the fundamentals of the game. And equally... You know, why do, people want to, why do people want to play golf? So what do they want on the course and what do they want off the course? And it ranges from everything from having a nice welcome in the clubhouse, you know, to not being about, you know, regardless of what gender you are, you're very welcome. You know, it's made to feel like it's home. And equally on the course, the course has got to be in great condition. The greens are going to be smooth. It doesn't take too long to play the round. It doesn't take too long to find the ball. You know, golfers are really, really clear about what they want from a club. And there is no shortage of data out there, right, to inform our view. And interestingly, in a lot of the surveys, core golfers, i.e. the core golfers are going to be older people because that is where the demographic in golf is, versus women, lapsed golfers, people who have stopped playing the game, and youth. Actually, we've got a huge amount in common. There is a huge amount in common in terms of what we want from a club and what we want from the game. The question is how well do we deliver it? There is some divergence, and it's probably a bit down to demographic, more than anything else, but um, there's still, for older golfers, a sense that formality in terms of dress and everything on the course is important, whereas females, younger golfers, really aren't that interested. If you look at things like Wi-Fi, you know, older, older golfers, core golfers want Wi-Fi in the clubhouse, but not in the course. Kids want it on the course. How you do that in the course, I've got no idea. It could be a challenge, but kids want to be able to use their phone on the course for all sorts of reasons, and, and, and Ross and the team from Deloitte will be covering that later today. But there isn't really any divergence there in terms of view. We're all pretty much aligned on what we want from the game. So the question is how well do we deliver it? How well do our clubs execute that proposition? And that's key. And equally, you know, in addressing the challenges, there is no room for complacency. You've seen the membership numbers. We've seen how that's going to continue if we do not address the situation we are in. 
And if you look at a summary of some of those views, you know, people, 25% say they can't recall when they were made to feel very welcome in a club. And I think the startling number, 65%, and go back to the point I made about family and friends and social, for a lot of people, if their family and friends leave the game, they'll leave the game as well. Because that's why they're there in the first place. And so when you summarize all of that, where do you end up? The one thing that comes out of every single survey that gets done, no matter what kind of survey it is, no matter who gets surveyed, the one thing that always comes out on top is the condition of the course. That is why people join a golf club. But the course has to be great. It doesn't have to be St. Andrews, it doesn't have to be Troon or anywhere else. It just has to be a nice course and good condition. That's what people pay for. Equally, people want the club to be well run. But as you can see, even though that's important, sometimes if you look at the satisfaction score, it's not as good as it should be. Now, I know golfers always have opinions. You know, nobody's short of an opinion about how to run the club and what should be done. But it clearly is a very, very important aspect of our golf clubs. Great customer service is really important as well. And a sense of being, of satisfaction, value, you know, being a member of a golf club, that's really important as well. But when you look at that time squeeze middle again, value is a real challenge because they've not got the time to justify the cost of the membership. So that's a look. That's a look inside the game. But actually, looking inside the game and asking members is only going to tell you what members want. What we're thinking about and what we've got to think about is non-members. It's the people who aren't members of Golf Club and how we get them into Golf Club membership, how we get them interested in the game, how we inspire them, how we motivate them to join golf clubs, and how, when they join golf clubs, we make it a fantastic experience. And that is what we have to understand. So I'll start with this, this guy, um, Charles Darwin, often misquoted, but um, you know, what, he, what he said was it's not... It's not the strongest, you know, nor the most intelligent that survive. It's those who are most responsive to change. And I think if I could make one observation about, about golf, it's that we are, as a community and as clubs, really slow to change. You know, we do not adapt well to what's happening in the outside world. You know, if you look how long, you know, so, so society's become more and more informal. Look how long it took us to adapt to genes and everything else in the clubhouse. You know, the digital age, you know, the rise and rise and rise of the mobile phone and the smartphone. Look how long it took us to adapt to that. You know, and in, a, in this world nowadays where that's becoming more diverse, where there's more information, you know, we have to adapt to that world. Because if we don't adapt to that world, somebody else will. And the people who th might have thought about playing golf will go somewhere else. So being able to adapt and respond uh, is really, really important. And the challenge for us is... You know, it's happening. Change is happening all the time. Mel alluded to it in his speech. And equally, we've got a bit of catching up to do on the past. So we've got a job of work to do right, to get golf really up to date right, and be, to be, or to have that kind of conscience in people's mind right, that it's a sport they want to play and why they want to join clubs. That is really, really important. So if you look at the world outside the golf, um, you know, our game has really struggled to respond, as I said, to generational, economic, technical change. Um, if you look at, you know, I feel really sorry I, I, you know, at times for, for club councils, club committees, because you know, they are run largely by volunteers. And if you look at the legislative environment we're in, you know, whether it's the Equality Act, whether it's you know, pensions, health and safety, child protection, and I'll talk about another, another thing called GDPR in a few minutes, this is volunteers. Most companies have got teams of people looking after these things. Uh, and as directors, the directors of the club have a legal responsibility. And it's, an, it's incredibly challenging to do this. It's incredibly challenging just to keep up with all the changes in legislation that affect golf clubs, never mind anything else. No, and that is not going to get any easier. You know, equally, uh, rising input costs. You know, the cost of Utilities, gas, the national living wage, all those things are going to continue to create headwinds for golf clubs in terms of its cost structure. But you can't stop them. You know, and there'll be more. You know, whether it's food inflation or anything else. You know, I've, got, I've got Brexit on there. You know, the uncertainty that comes out of Brexit as well you know, is a real challenge. Because nobody really knows what's going to happen to input costs. You know, you've already seen the impact of the, the pound declining and it's put food costs up massively, way beyond inflation. So for golf clubs serving food, 
That could be a real challenge, and who knows what else it will bring. But it will bring challenge, no matter what. And then you've got something called generational diversity. You know, and what I'm talking about specifically is young people. You know, there's a group of people in society called Generation Y or Millennials. Millennials were born roughly between the early 80s and the early 2000s. They are unlike any generation right, that's gone before them. They're not like Generation X, not like the baby boomers or, or anyone that, or the, the, the post-war um, post uh, kids. They are very, very different in their behavior. And it's really easy to stereotype them because it's, it's, you know, we can always say, uh, well, you know, all they want to do is sit at home and play with their Xbox. Well, they might do, but that's golf's problem because if we haven't made our game attractive enough or club membership attractive enough, that's what they'll do. You can't blame the customer because they don't want, they don't want your product. You know, that's up to you to do something about it, not them. Equally, they are an incredibly well-informed generation. You know, they are the kids of the digital age. They were brought up in a digital world. You know, when I was at school, if you wanted to find out about a subject, you had to go to the library, you had to get everything from Encyclopedia Britannia to other books on a subject to learn about it. Nowadays, you just type the words into Google and bang, you've got 200 million pieces of information at your disposal. They are an incredibly well-informed generation. Uh, and they understand the world much better, much, much better than any generation before them any generation. Equally, um, they believe in diversity. So in a way that my generation and previous generations you know, never quite got diversity, for them diversity is very, very important. So when they look at some of, the, some of the situations in golf clubs that I alluded to earlier, they find that quite confusing. You know, they, they embrace liberalism. They embrace equality. And when they don't find that, they find that quite a challenge. You know, and if you don't believe me, just go and talk to a 19-year-old. Go and talk to a 20-year-old, a 25-year-old. Ask them, uh, and they'll tell you. you know, it is a, they have a very, very different perspective on the world than we do. And of course, that gives clubs a bit of a problem. Because when you start to talk to members in a club who are 55, 60, 65, 70, there is no way, no way in this world that they will be able to articulate what a 20-year-old wants. I guarantee it. Uh, it's not possible. Uh, and I will put that into context that, uh, again, in one of these, these kind of books I've, I've read about what, what's going to happen in the next 50 years, the American car industry, to put this into context, has spent half a billion dollars trying to understand why millennials won't buy cars. Half a billion dollars, loads of management consultants and some really clever people, and at the end of it, they still don't know. They still don't understand why millennials won't buy cars. So if they can't do it with half a billion dollars, what chance volunteers in a golf club or on a Scottish golf board or anywhere else? It is an incredible challenge to understand what young people want nowadays. But the only way to find out is to go and ask them. Equally, you know, we live in the technological age as well, the connected age of digital media. So, you know, you... And again, it's a real, you know, we saw today how, you know, it was a wee bit challenging for everybody to get logged on. If this had been a group, of, a room full of 20-year-olds, it would have been done in about 10 seconds. They would have been right into it. All right. You cannot underestimate the power of technology and digital in, in this day and age. And the reality is, it's not going away. So when these 20-year-olds become 60, they're not suddenly going to stop using it. All right. it. It will just be on steroids by the time they get to 60-year-old. It is not going to change. Absolutely not going to change. And we have to embrace it. It is a very different world. Now, I spoke to, when, when we, we did a sort of run through this presentation with some of the, the, the representatives from the areas and counties, and one of the examples that came through was, was around going out and leafleting people to get new members. The reality is, uh, in this day and age, if you use Facebook, if you want to find women in your local community who've got kids and everything else, just go on Facebook. Uh, there'll be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women on there. That's how a lot of women nowadays communicate. That's how they engage in the community, the activity of the community, the understanding of what's going on in the community. We have a local paper called The Advertiser. I have no idea how it's still in business because if anything happens in Bonnie Rig, my wife knows within five minutes. <laughs> you know, so how the paper can survive, I've got no idea. Uh, and the reality is, instead of going out and leafleting to get 50 women to try and get 23 members, I think was the number, and I apologize if I've got that wrong, uh, 
You could hit 500 women, 1,000 women, within about two minutes for a proper Facebook campaign. And then the next again day, you could do it again and again and again and again. And whether it's an offer of coming to the club to have coffee or social get-togethers or anything else, the power of that is phenomenal. And clubs, we need to embrace it. You know, we are not connected well as a, as a golfing community, as, as clubs or, or as a governing body or areas and counties or anything else. We are not well connected and we need to harness the power of that. And then the other one, and I know this came through the, the strategy discussion and everything else that was had, data. I find this absolutely fascinating, um, this thing about data, because one of the things that came out of that discussion was, oh, well, you know, you're going to take your email addresses and you're going to use them and sell them. Yeah, that's what people did in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Data is now way, way, way more sophisticated than that. And if people were worried about that, let me put it into context. If you've ever used Facebook, Google, Twitter, TripAdvisor, ever had a Tesco club card, ever bought anything from John Lewis, right? Etal, 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 your data is out there and it is being used. It's being used by organizations, businesses, corporations, marketing companies, everybody. You ever thought it's quite spooky how if you go into the Scotsman online, uh, and you've been Googling for something, say a new pair of shoes, and suddenly those shoe adverts start appearing. Uh, it's a bit spooky, isn't it? It's not spooky at all. You ever wondered why, if you go into Google Maps, uh, it can tell you where all the traffic jams are? Because it's tracking all our phones. And it knows uh, where that phone's stationary on a road. And there's a collection of phones stationary on a road. It's not got a guy standing looking. Uh, it's basically from satellite data. It knows exactly where every single car is and whether it's moving or not. Everything we do is being tracked. So the power of that data for golf is absolutely massive. Um, you can't underestimate it. We live in a data economy. Our kids are growing up in a data economy. Uh, it's all about insight and all about information. Yet as a golfing community, you know, we, we lack information. Trying to pull this presentation together was an absolute nightmare because we have so little data on our game. But yet, when you look at the potential to get sponsors, into the game and more commercial funding into the game, I kid you not, the power lies in coming together as a community and sharing our data in order to do that and having more insight into our game and more understanding of what's happening in the game so we can make better decisions. That is really, really important. And when you combine data with that legislative environment, just to give you a good example, how many in the room said the GDPR? Yeah, GDPR will hit us in May, and it's a, it, it is effectively a massive step forward in terms of the data standard and data compliance standard that government wants and the EU wants in respect of, of, of citizens' data. Um, the impact is massive. It is, it is the biggest single subject in industry at the moment is how you deal with this. You know, if you've got particularly sensitive consumer data, it's incredibly challenging relative to what you want to do with it. And equally, the security policies you now have to have are unbelievably onerous. Equally, the impact of that is massive as well. Because if you get it wrong, and it applies to golf clubs too, you'll be fined 4% of your turnover, and anybody can complain. Anybody can make a, a complaint to the information commissioner or, who, or whoever about their data not being used improperly. Well, data is really, really important. It's a new oil. It's a new water. Data is absolutely everything. And equally, you know, for kids in clubs, you know, we want to get more kids, more families into clubs, but the requirements in relative to children's data, under 16's data, is a real challenge as well. And again, what we're asking is, is volunteers to manage that. Volunteers to have proper security policies in place in a club to manage that. It is a real, real challenge. Please do not underestimate it. But equally, you know, as I look to society, what, what else do we see? You know, we live in a society now where, where people simply, consumers, and we're all consumers, everybody in this room is a consumer, we do not tolerate mediocrity. You know, time is so precious, experiences are so precious that we won't settle for second best anymore. And if you look on the left-hand side there, they're all businesses who just simply failed to respond to what the customers wanted. They're all dead, they're all gone, they're all buried. If you look on the right-hand side, 
Those are all businesses that are successful, who responded to what the customers want, who recognized changing demographics, changing needs from their consumers. The whole digital landscape, they absolutely got. So whether it's HMV, still trying to sell CDs to Spotify, who were the first big streaming company, they absolutely got it. Totally got it. Amazon. You know, Amazon is, is the best thing that's ever been invented for men. Because we can sit and watch the football, the rugby, the cricket, the tennis, and do our Christmas shopping at the same time. It's fantastic. You know, you know, I mean, it's a dream come true not to be dragged around the shops in Edinburgh at Christmas time. Uh, and equally, IKEA kind of realized, unlike MFI, who used to produce crap and charge you a fortune, IKEA realized we can still produce crap but don't charge very much for it because they want to throw it away after two years if it lasts that long. You know, that, that is the reality of the consumer world we live in, in today, and, and it's important that we recognize that. Equally, you know, I've already touched on the whole digital age. You know, many, many moons ago, you know, we had you know, TV for getting, across, getting messages to consumers, we, the local newspaper, email, we could phone them. Nowadays, the world is your oyster in terms of communicating. You know, and if we want to really engage, you know, whether it's members, non-members, young people in local communities, you've got to do it through digital. There is no point putting an advert right, for golf club membership in the local paper and thinking 20-year-olds are going to read it. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you've got to use the medium that's best going to target and connect with the audience that you want to get into the club. And using digital is the absolute best way to do it. My mother, 73-year-old, and we've got her on Twitter, Facebook, and everything else. Sometimes she writes some things that worry the hell at me. But, but at least I've got her connected. And we can share family photos and all of that stuff, or holidays. You know, it's just absolutely fantastic. It has its pitfalls, but we absolutely have to embrace it. And equally, the experience we want uh, from our products nowadays has moved on materially. Absolutely materially. Even in the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and our expectations keep moving forward at a, at a rate of change, at a pace that will, will be unrelenting. This is the slowest we will ever go. Because next year it will be faster, and the year after that it will be faster still. So we have to, as clubs, as golf, have to be able to respond to that. Because if we just sit in the slow end and think it's okay... All right, it's not going to happen. And the reality is that wine will just come true and it will keep going down and down and down. And the harsh reality for us is that, you know, and if I use this analogy for golf, nobody wants to buy an Austin Princess in a BMW world unless you have some kind of nostalgia for standing by the side of the road waiting on a breakdown truck. You know, our, our taste, our preferences, our needs, our choices have all evolved materially. And we need to move with that. We need to recognize that. You know, it's really, really important for the game. So when someone turns up at a golf club and they can't get through the front door because there's a lock of that on it, uh, that's not a great experience. You wouldn't expect to go down to your local restaurant, your local bar, your local Costa and find that. Right? So we need to move on. We need to make golf a great experience, right? Our club's a great experience. Uh, and that is how we will get more people into the game. And we have to be responsive. And if there's, any, if there's any young people uh, here, and there's quite a few that I see, here's a really top business tip. The Austin Princess is what happens when you've got accountants do your product design and development and manufacture, uh, as opposed to the Germans who let engineers do it. And equally, you know, in this day and age, feedback, feedback comes is, is fast and brutal. You know, it's no longer is it somebody writing a letter to the local paper or what have you. You know, the feedback in this is just so easy to do. And people won't even tell you. They'll just go out the door, they'll put it on Facebook, they'll put it on Twitter, Revu, TripAdvisor, you name it. There's 101 places you can go to put feedback on and rate a business. If you go into Google, you know, and you just Google, say, you know, if you Google uh, Costa, it'll find the Costa in your area because it knows where geographically you're located, uh, and it'll give you a rating that everybody's given on that Costa. Right? Feedback is, is, is incredibly powerful. If you get it right, it can make you. If you don't, if you do something wrong, it can break you. And let me put, let me just put it into context, right, about how, because people talk about how viral media is. If one person has a good or a bad experience, and they put it on Facebook, right, under the assumption, and this is Facebook statistics, that 
one person will effectively share something with another seven people. And that will keep happening. Those seven people will then share with seven people that they know. So if, if somebody has an experience in a golf club, good or bad, and puts it on Facebook and shares it with seven people, and every five minutes they share it with another seven people, how many people within an hour right, have got that post? Two billion. Two billion. And it's the same for all other media as well. Right, you cannot, so just think in a community how long it's going to take to get to 500, right? If you do something good or you do something bad and it gets, goes on Facebook. It is, you cannot underestimate the power of this. But if we can harness the power of it, you know, for good, for the good of the game, the good of our clubs, it can be incredibly powerful. And just to put that into, into context, um, Nokia in 2007 were the world's biggest mobile phone company. You know, the product was unassailable in the, in the mobile phone market. Five years later, right, as a phone company, they were dead. Five years from the world's biggest right, to nothing. Because they didn't see smart, the smartphone coming through from Apple and BlackBerry. Right, they didn't respond to what their customers wanted. And the end was swift and the end was brutal. And that's what happens in today's consumer world if you don't deliver what consumers want. And golfers like everybody in the room is, are consumers. You have to deliver what people want or they'll simply go elsewhere. So, what are our options? We can keep going. All right. We can actually just keep going as we are. All right. Keep doing the same old things and keep getting the same old results. All right. And the line will keep going south. All right. And in five years' time, we'll be having the same conversation about what's gone wrong in golf and why are we not getting more people into club membership. Or we can take the tough option. And that's to do something about it. And it will be tough. You know, this is, of all the business the problems I've seen in the business world that I've had to deal with, this is by far and away the toughest thing I've ever seen. Because this is it's incredibly complex. Right, trying, to, trying to get the game turned around in this country is not going to be easy, but it's not impossible. It's absolutely not impossible, but it means we have to change and we have to do things differently. We have to accept that what we've done in the past, right, some of it maybe may have worked, but a lot of it hasn't worked, because if it had worked, we'd be looking at a very different landscape. And if you keep doing the things you've always done, you'll keep getting the results you always had. So we've got to change and we've got to do things differently. And equally, you know, I said at the start, I don't come at this with any kind of politics or background or any interest in the, the, the power in golf or anything else. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you at the end of this why I'm standing up here on a Saturday when I could be doing a whole lot of other things. Um, but we're all in this together. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are in the game, what you do, we're all in this together. Well, we can sit here, right, for the rest of the day and have a debate about structures and shareholdings and all of that stuff. It will be really, really interesting. We can have a discussion about who gets the best deck chair right, and who gets to sit at the captain's table. But at the end of the day, we're all on the Titanic. Just don't forget that. It doesn't matter who's sitting the furthest from the hole in the boat. The boat's only going in one direction if we choose to do nothing about it. And the reality is we can address all the structural stuff in golf, we can have another hundred new committees, anything you want, I guarantee you it's not going to fix that problem. It will be the same next year and the year after that and the year after that because what we need to address at the core of this is the experience people have in our clubs and of our game. That is what we need to address. Committees and all of that, forget it. Won't touch it. So food for thought, and this will form the basis of, of, of the questions that we're, we're going to discuss um, over lunch in our working groups. You know, how do we ad address the demographic opportunity in the game? Um, how do we get future generations involved in the game and clubs into club membership? And how do we do it meaningfully and quickly? Because we've got, we have got no time to lose. No time at all. Every single week that goes by, another, on average, another 90 people leave club membership. Oh, but, and by the time we get to the end of the year, it'll be another four and a half to 5,000. We cannot con afford to continue hemorrhaging in that way. How can we creatively address the dynamic between club membership and nomadic golfers, fees versus round pricing and competitive versus social golf? The hard thing that we have got to accept here 
is that we, lost, we have lost control of three things here. We've lost control of pricing. We've allowed visitor around pricing to become almost commoditized. It's not about the value the club offers anymore. It's just about who's got the lowest price. Uh, equally, when it's so easy to go and book nowadays, we've lost control of the whole access to the product as well. Because actually people can just go online and book and come to the golf course. And equally, we've lost control of the data because we've handed it over to other companies who now manage a lot of our data for us who now understand what's going on in terms of round pricing, and how many rounds are played, etc. You know, but as a game, we don't have that information, and we need to get back in control of that. Equally, you know, regularly surveying members is really important. Members substitute word customers. Customers looking for a great experience, or they're going to walk away. Or they're going to find something better to spend their money on. So regularly surveying them is really important. But how do we recruit a new generation of members through better understanding their needs as consumers? So looking outside the game, not just inside the game. What do golf clubs need to do differently um, to respond and adapt successfully in a society where consumer choice and behavior uh, is evolving and we no longer tolerate mediocrity? What do we need to do? What do clubs need to do? You know, do we have the right governance in clubs? Do we have the right governance structure in clubs? Are we talking about the right subjects? Are we really focused on you know, the digital economy? Are we really focused on what's happening outside the club to get more members in? Or are we still talking about the state of the bunker at the 13th? Because I can tell you, you can talk about the state of the bunker at the 13th all day. It's not going to fix that line. It'll be really interesting, I'm sure, but it's not going to fix the line. And finally, in our data-driven economy, how can we utilize club and golfer data to create powerful insight and opportunity that allows us to act for the greater good of the game. You know, and I just want to re-emphasize this point. This is not about the governing body wanting power. I couldn't care less about power. Power is only any good if you use it responsibly. And if you don't use it responsibly, then frankly, you should not be doing what you're doing. Uh, it's about acting for the greater good of the game because we are all a golfing community and we all have something to lose if this game continues to decline the way it is. So I want, over the course of lunch, um, and, and in our working groups, I want people to really, really think, this is where we need to engage and find the answers, to get ideas, suggestions. You know, to think that a, a board is going to come, uh, come up with all the answers, frankly, is not going to happen. It, never, it doesn't happen in business, and it won't happen in golf. It needs everyone to contribute. You know, and finally, um, some words. Uh, I, I don't know how much you read, but Churchill's quite an interesting character to read about. And, you know, although he didn't do everything right, you know, his, his attitude was probably his most important characteristic. And here's the thing. This is not going to be fixed with a silver bullet you can buy from Amazon. This is, this is going to take time. Right, we're going to get some things wrong. We're, going to get, we're hopefully going to get more things right. right. It's a really complex challenge to get golf membership out of decline, turned around, and moving in the right direction. And it needs everybody in this room to do it. You know, if you think the, the board can do it or, or the great volunteers or, or areas, and, areas and counties can do it, it's not going to happen. We need to act collectively to do that. And when the going gets tough, you get up, you dust yourself down, and you keep going. You don't give up, you don't give in. So, um, I said at the start, I'll tell you why I'm standing here on a, on a Saturday, and it, and it really comes down to, comes down to two things. Um, first is the love of the game. Now, I've played since I was seven years old when I took my dad's clubs down the local park um, and uh, just kind of knocked the ball up and down. That was before the council sold them. Uh, kids couldn't do that now. Uh, aiming for the goalposts, you know, get nearest the goalposts, nearest the jerseys on the, the football pitch or anything else. I just loved the game. Uh, the first time I ever got on a golf course was at, at Gifford down in East Lothian where our friend's dad used to, to take me down every weekend. You know, reality is we couldn't afford club membership. And I absolutely enjoyed it. And, um, and equally, you know, I can lay claim to some fame in that I probably invented the first ever council house practice net when I rearranged my mother's washing lines and bed sheets uh, so I could hit the ball into them and stop them going to old Mrs. Lorimer's garden. That didn't end very well, but uh, at least it was, uh, it was good fun when you were a kid. And the second reason is about legacy, because... I really worry that if we, if we keep going as we're going, this game is not going to be here for our kids, not as we know it now. And equally importantly, the game is not going to be here for our, for our communities. Clubs are not going to be here in their communities. All right, because there is no way, if we get to 120,000 members in 10 years' time, we can sustain 600 clubs. 
It's just not possible. So, you know, and that for me is a travesty because when you think about this, this great game that we all love, you know, it's a game where you can play from six to 106. You know, there's loads of other games you can't do that. You, know, you won't be playing football at 106 or rugby. You, you probably struggle to do it at 56, never mind 106. So it's a game that everybody can play. Equally, it has a handicapping system right, that allows us to all play in a level playing field. And it's also a game that allows men to play against women, women to play against women, men to play against men, against kids, because it crosses the generations. You know, and so few games right, in life afford that opportunity. Equally, it's a game that teaches us a lot about life. It teaches us about respect and about integrity and about honesty. It also teaches us right, that when you get knocked down, you get back up again right, and you keep going. Because it doesn't matter what happened at the 14th. What really matters now is what you do at the 15th. It doesn't matter what happened on the front nine. What you do now in the back nine is the most important thing because you can't change the score in the front nine. So you get up, dust yourself down, and get on. And I guess, you know, that, that kind of says everything about golf, doesn't it? That's the front nine. We've seen it the last 10 years. The question now is what we choose to do in the next 10 years. It will be a challenge, no doubt. You know, there are a lot of things we need to change and a lot of ways we need to adapt and evolve the game and, and club membership. But the one thing I can guarantee you is the whole board is up for that, or they wouldn't be here today. I'm up for that, or I wouldn't be here today. And I just hope that after today, everybody in this room and every single golfer in Scotland is up for it. Thank you. We are Scottish Golf.